So if you're just starting residency, you will be overwhelmed by the amount of information that you have to learn. The learning curve is so steep. In this video, I will explain to you how to absorb as much as information as possible and how to become a better physician during your residency. So stay tuned. Hello everyone, my name is Rupen. I'm an internal medicine resident in Canada. I'm finishing my internal medicine residency. And in the past three years, I learned a lot during my residency. And I wanted to create this video to share my experience on how to learn and how to organize the information that you will get in your residency. Whether you are doing a medical residency or whether you are doing a surgical residency, you are there to learn. But you will be surprised by the amount of information you will get. You will learn when you are doing your daily rounds, when your staff is a running list with you. When you go and see a patient, you will learn something new from that patient. They might teach you something about their condition. And then you have academic half days and lectures and academic weeks. So you will absorb lots of information in your lectures as well. And you will learn from your mistakes. So there will be lots of information coming to you. And the beginning of the residency, I was overwhelmed by this amount of information. I didn't know how to store them. I didn't know what to do with them. I just went and attended a lecture and then like I went and have a drink with friends. But looking backward, I wish I developed a system where I stored the information in a better way. So let's start by these rules. So rule number one, use a system and stick to it to take notes. Some people like Apple Notes, some people like Evernote, some people use Notion, others use Anki for taking notes. Yes, I use Anki for taking notes. Some people like Google Keep. So there are lots of ways to store this information. Whichever you like, whichever system you like, use it. But the most important thing is stick to it and use it over the years of your residency. Don't jump from one system to another. And that brings me to the second point. What is considered a good and efficient system or a software to store this information? So one, it should be accessible, whether it's on your phone or you can access it online from a computer. I tried to use a tablet or an iPad, but the problem is it was not portable and during COVID, I was worried to take my iPad to the hospital because it will get infected. And it wasn't easy always to access uh, my iPad when I'm on rounds, I'm flying. But when I'm doing, when I'm storing information using my phone, so it's much more easier to access the software or sometimes I even access it from one of the computers uh, in the hospital where I go and log in to, the one, uh, to Anki and like put my, the things that I learned uh, into Anki. So in the beginning, I used OneNote, but then I switched to Anki and I will tell you why. So let me tell you a bit about how I use Anki to store information. But before that, let me tell you why I like Anki. One, because you can tag information. So when I add extra or new notes into Anki, I just don't need to scroll down and up to go to a specific location. Like if I want to add information related to the respiratory system, or cardiovascular system, I don't scroll up and down looking where is the cardiovascular system related notes like I used to do in OneNote. So I just add the information in a one deck and I can tag them. The second thing I like is the image occlusion feature of Anki. Let's say I went to an academic half day and by the end of the lectures, the presenter gave us uh, slides and I want to use those slides for my learning. So the image occlusion tool help me to take those slides and occlude the important parts that I want to use for my own learning. The third thing is it's accessible and it's easy to use. I can download Anki on my phone, I download Anki on my laptop, I downloaded Anki on my tablet. So wherever I go, the information is there. Those three features made me really love Anki to take notes and to learn my notes. Let me show you this in this video. Okay, so let me show you how I like uh, quickly add information to my Anki. Uh, before talking about Anki, like I used to use OneNote. It's a great, but like what I found is just, it takes time to go to the place where I want to put my note in. Let's say I'm on an internal medicine ward and on internal medicine ward, like you see lots of different information, right? You see uh, heart failure, you see COPD, you see pneumonia, and one day you might learn, or like at one hour, you might learn something about COPD. Another hour, you might learn something about heart failure, especially like the learning curve in the first year of your residency is like 
very steep like you learn a lot every day on how to manage different things and how, storing those information was important for me so but what i found is like opening one note from my phone or from one of the computers in the hospital and then going to uh, the respirology section and then going to the copd section it took so time and then organizing the notes was like it took it, it's not that long but in a fast paced environment like the hospital like i need something to store my notes asap as quick as possible uh, so that's why I started like thinking about Anki and how I can access information quickly. And the nice thing about Anki is like, at the end of the day, when I look backward to the year, to the three years of residency, and I review the things that I learned, I know exactly where this information came from. Let me give you an example. So one of the days I had a patient with gastroparesis, and for those people who are not familiar with gastroparesis watching the video so gastroparesis is a condition where your stomach just became becomes really um, impaired and cannot empty uh, to the small bowel okay so it's and this patient had gastroparesis because of type 1 diabetes and he had really severe bad peripheral and autonomic neuropathy uh, so he had really severe gastroparesis so and I was like I was the one responsible for taking care of this patient uh, so I knew how to manage, I, I remember the first line treatment. So I was like talking to the staff and the staff asked me, oh, like, what's the first, second, the third line of treatment? I said like, okay, so we can start with metoclopramide. And he said like, okay, the patient is already on metoclopramide. What's next? And I just like stopped and I could not remember. And then he said, okay, we can use like domperidone or we can use erythromycin. So that was a gap in my knowledge in managing gastroparesis. So I was... Uh, aware of that gap at that point after the staff told me so I went and I read about gastroparesis so what I did at that moment is quickly I can I opened Anki like you can open Anki from your phone or you can uh, just quickly while you're doing your notes access it from one of the computers in the hospital and as you can see here I have different uh, uh, decks so the RC stands for the Royal College, the U word is the American Board of Internal Medicine. So I have also one thing that I learned, like this is, I created this for Anki. I have one for the wards and rounds. I think I, I learned from my academic half days and the things that I learned while I'm on the round on the go. So quickly I can, uh, I opened it. I went to the ward and rounds. I read about gastroparesis. I added a quickly a card on this. Okay, so just let me uh, bring this uh, here. Okay. So I read about gastroparesis from up to date, and then I added the information that was I was lacking, and then quickly I wrote what are okay, and quickly I tag this with gastro. As you can see, I already have the gastroparesis tag. So this info, I added it quickly and gastroparesis is done. So I did not spend some time just going and finding the right section. Now, if I go to my tags in Anki, okay, and the, I browse, okay, let me show you, I have like lots of tags and that's the great thing about Anki, it's, it's really an efficient way to store information. Let me put this here, okay, and I scroll down to the tag gastroparesis, and G, okay, so, as you can see, I have the one from the, uh, this info I learned it from while I was on the round. Uh, this info I learned it from the U word. Uh, I took some information prepared for my American board exam. So I took some notes from the U word of American Board of Internal Medicine, uh, causes, diagnostic algorithm, treatments. So by the end of the day, um, in a one year or two when I'm practicing medicine, I just want to review gastroparesis. I can quickly go to gastroparesis and review the information that I knew. And if I want to add other information, it's so easy to add the information and tag them with gastroparesis. And over the years, you're going to see you're going to accumulate more information about specific conditions. And you don't need to know everything about a condition to be able to treat it. You need to know the specific things that will help you in the diagnosis and the specific things that will help you in the treatment. Okay. So this is a quick explanation of how I use Anki on the world. Again, different people have different ways of storing information, but make sure early in your residency to have a way that uh, to store information, you can access those notes quickly, easily, 
and um, efficiently where it does not hinder your workflow. Rule number two, prepare early for your board exam. Yes, whether you are in your first year, whether you are in second year, you can still prepare for your board exam. You don't need to wait until your third year. And why I'm saying this, the main goal of this rule is I want you to use the textbook or the question bank that people in your residency use for their board exam early in your learning to get familiar with the contents of the board. The board exams are not only there to test you and you pass a test and then you have the license. No, the board exams are there to help you to learn and prepare for the exam and absorb as much as information possible because at the end of the day, after you finish your residency, you become a physician, you go to the community or an academic hospital to practice, it's you, the patient, and the amount of knowledge or skills that you had during or you, you, can, um, you learned during your residency. So when you prepare early for the board exams, you get familiar with the guidelines and you get familiar how medicine is practiced early, which helps you when you're going to write the exam in your third or your last year of residency and you don't get overwhelmed. Let me give you an example. So in Canada, we do the Royal College of Internal Medicine board exam. One of the things I wish I did differently in my residency is looking backward, I wish I used the same material for the Royal College Internal Medicine board exam early in my first year. For example, if I was doing, or when I did my endocrinology rotation, if I used the material that I used for my Royal College exam in my third year, I would know the guidelines and what is in the guidelines in my first year. So when I do the rotation and I see how different staff practice, I will know what is in the guideline and I will know what is a common sense or common practice in that hospital. So familiarizing yourself early with the guidelines helps you to absorb more information during your residency and also helps you to become more familiar with the exam content at the end of your residency and you don't get overwhelmed. Rule number three, write down your mistakes. Okay, so I have a, big, uh, a book recommendation. One of the books I read recently is called How Doctors Think. And it's a very recommend, like it, it's, it's a highly recommended book. It's a great book. And the author was talking about one of the great diagnosticians. And he said, what made this physician a great diagnostician is, he wrote down his mistakes. He had a notebook where he wrote down his mistakes. And he always looked back into his old mistakes. So that prevented him from doing those mistakes again. Unfortunately, in medicine, there are lots of medical errors, which sometimes we can't prevent. Healthcare and taking care of patients is just becoming very complex. So when you write down your own mistakes in your learning system, software, application, notebook, or whatever, and you always look back to those mistakes, so you prevent those mistakes happening again in the future. So one, you will learn from your mistakes. Two, you will become a better physician. Three, you will deliver better patient care. So write down your mistakes and read how doctors think. Highly recommended. Rule number four. Think again about the physical exam. When I started residency, I examined every patient. Part of it was because I had to write the exam in my note. Part of it because if my staff asked me, did you examine the patient? Did you listen to their lungs? Did you listen to their heart? And it was more something I have to do, more than something I enjoy in doing. But again, I have a book recommendation, highly recommended. Read Every Patient Tells a Story. Once you read this book, your view to the physical exam will change. You will do a physical exam because you know it will change your management and you will not do the physical exam just for the sake of doing it. Usually for residents, there is a huge pressure to do your best and do everything and documenting, especially for medical students. But after I read this book, my view to the physical exam changed. Why? Let me give you an example. So let's say I'm on internal medicine on the consult team and the emergency physician consult the internal medicine team or me to go and see a patient who presented with shortness of breath. 
So this patient, while he's in the emergency, already had a CT scan, which showed clear lung fields and no pulmonary embolism. If I go and listen to their lungs, would that change my management? No. But, or let's say most likely no. But if I have a patient who is admitted to the ward, he's a patient who has COPD and he was admitted for COPD exacerbation. He's been on antibiotics for two days and he has been getting better. But the night I was on call, he suddenly developed acute shortness of breath. Would my exam change the management of this patient? 100% yes. Why? Because if you listen to their lungs and you find asymmetry in the lung entry, you can diagnose pneumothorax. So this is a life-threatening condition, but the treatment is with a needle in the second intercostal space. If you look at their legs and you find some asymmetry between the right and the left calf, so you can immediately think about pulmonary embolism and you send them immediately to a CTPE or you start them on anticoagulation. Because patients with COPD have higher likelihood of developing pulmonary embolisms, right? So examining the patient at this point is very crucial. And having the strongest skills for exam is very important. Physical exam is not something that you learn overnight. It's a skill that you develop and hone over the years. I sometimes get surprised that some staff go and ask a medical student, what type of murmur are you hearing? And most likely they will not know. You can't learn a murmur by like listening to some one or two patients uh, heart sounds. Knowing what type of murmur you are hearing requires years and years and years of practice. Seeing the JVP, examining the JVP requires hundreds of, seeing hundreds of patients with staff and by yourself. So work on daily basis on your physical exam skills, which is very important. And develop those skills because those skills are valuable. And if you don't believe me, please read the book, which is highly recommended. Every patient tells a story, especially if you love House MD TV series. This book is written by the same author. Rule number five, reassess what really matters to the patient. Again, I have a highly recommended book, Being Mortar, by Dr. Atul Gawande. Medicine and what matters at the end. This is a great book that I read during my residency, and it's really changed how I approach medical conditions and disease and elderly people and patients. People are getting older, and their medical conditions are becoming more complex. And we have more treatments now. We can keep people alive. But the question to ask yourself is, what type of quality of life the patient will have when you treat their medical condition? And does this matter to the patient? As physicians, the hardest thing is not to do, like just sit down and do nothing. This, this is very hard. And it's something, that, something I noticed when I was like on, on rotations with different staff, like you can't see a patient, you can't see a lab abnormality, you can't spend your day just looking at a patient without doing anything. We always want to do something because we have that urge that we want to make people feel better. And that's totally right. That's why we are there. That's why we go to medical school six years or four years and then we do residency three years to five years because like main goal is to treat disease and to help people live longer. But the thing that we don't learn very well in most medical schools is to assess what really matters to the patient. So if you read this book, it will change your view on how you approach disease by not taking into consideration your own opinion and how you want to treat a condition, but also involving your patient and knowing what truly really matters for them. Again, highly recommended, being mortal. Dr. Atul Gawande, great book. Rule number six, be good to yourself. And I highly recommend this. I highly emphasize, emphasize this. Lots of people, when they match residency in the first month in July, I get lots of messages and lots of emails. Oh, I don't know how to treat this condition. I feel completely useless. I feel I'm just writing notes. I'm not contributing to the team. 
I feel like I'm making people go slower. I feel they don't like me. I don't know how I'm gonna do this for three years or two years or five years. Like, you are there to learn. Remember this, residency is for your own learning. So you can't go there and think that you will be able to treat conditions, you will be able to cure people, you will be able to do the right thing always. Because if you're able to treat the con all the conditions out in your specialty and you do the right thing all the time, like you don't need residency, you can just go out and practice medicine. And in the beginning, especially in the first couple of months, residency is gonna be painful. And it's okay if you cry. I remember many times where I went home, I was like crying because I felt overwhelmed and I felt I didn't know what to do. And I, I didn't know how to survive, but be good to yourself. Not knowing is completely normal. And I 100% assure you, you will learn over time. And when I say over time, I don't say, I don't mean months. It's okay, it will take you sometimes a year or two. It took me almost two years and a half of seeing hundreds of patients and then writing my Royal College exam to become really comfortable in managing patients. And still, there are things that I don't know. I just want to ask my staff because patients don't come with one medical condition. They always come with multiple medical conditions that they are interacting together with each other. So there is always the wisdom of weighing the risks versus the benefits. And that's the clinical sense that you will develop in your residency and when you practice medicine. So enjoy your residency and make sure to learn as much as possible, but be good to yourself. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the subscribe button below and turn on the notification. If you have any questions regarding residency, don't hesitate to email me. My email is mentioned below. Have a great day. Thank you for watching.